What's good, YouTube? It is your boy, Big Cool, coming to you from Colossal Sports TV. And I am back with another video. This is The Rundown, discussing boxing's latest news. First up, finally, we could be seeing Tevin Farmer make a defense against a fighter that has a well-known name inside the boxing world. And when I say that, I mean hardcore boxing fans know and respect this fighter. That fighter is Jojo Diaz. These two guys have somewhat of a, a tension-filled history. They came face-to-face -face about four or five months ago. Verbal altercation, um, cussing each other out, threatening to whoop each other's ass, blase, blase. And that didn't lead to a fight. But now that these two guys have taken care of their business in their respective fights, Jojo Diaz more recently, I think this past weekend, he won a majority decision over, I'm going to pull up his name because I want to get uh, the guy's name correct before I just say anything, try to give you all as much information as possible. Yes, he um won a, a majority decision over Jesus Quadro uh, this past weekend. Afterwards, he proceeded to call out Tevin Former yet again. Um, this is a fight that has a lot of intrigue to me, and it makes the most sense when you look at it. All the other junior lightweight champions are occupied right now. Jamal Heron will be making a mandatory defense against Lamont Roach in November. Miguel Beltran, uh, Burchard, excuse me, is going to be facing Jason Sosa. And Andre Cancio is tied up, and I think he's headed to a rematch um, as well. I can't think of uh, the guy's name. But those guys being tied up means no possible way for a unification bout to take place at this present moment in time. So what better thing for Tevin Foreman to do is to get his ass back in the gym and prepare for a tough Jojo Diaz who only has one career defeat in 31 fights. Uh, that long defeat came at the hands of Gary Russell Jr. back in May of last year where he lost a unanimous decision. It was somewhat competitive early on, but the athleticism, speed, and boxing ability of Gary Russell proved to be too much for the talented yet un outgunned Jojo Diaz. But this fight um, is an interesting stylistic matchup because we all know Tevin Former couldn't crack an egg in a food fight if you gave him if you gave him a hammer. That's just the truth. You know he is not a puncher whatsoever, but what he is is an excellent boxer. He is very defensive minded, has excellent reflexes, excellent counter punching ability, and excellent hand speed. You know he's from Philadelphia, so he's tough. You know he's went through the ringer early on in his career, evident by his four losses in. It has made him the fighter he is today, being a IBF junior lightweight champion that have made four consecutive defenses of that title. And, you know, his skill set allows him to be a tough out for anybody, even with the lack of threat of power in his punches. Joseph Diaz, on the other hand, is a guy that isn't a huge puncher, but he has 15 knockouts. He is a Deontay Wilder type puncher if you compare his power to that of Tevin Former. He is a pressure fighter. He comes forward. You know, he's a former 2012 Olympian. Uh, he's a terrific body puncher. You know, he's been in some action packed fights. Uh, he's only 26 years old, 0 and 1 in title uh, fight opportunities. This will be his second fight. Uh, fighting the world title if the uh, deal can get done. And I'll post a link from 3kingsboxing.com where um, we reported on that uh, that Eddie Hearn intends to extend the offer over to Golden Boy and Joseph Diaz to try to make a fight for later this year, early 2020. Um, it is interesting enough that while Jojo Diaz did get the victory. He stated in his post-fight interview that he suffered an injury to his left hand. That's why the fight was tougher than it um, should have been. That's why he wasn't his, his normal self punch output. He wanted to conserve um, and, you know, not further do further damage to that left hand. Um, and he said that he declared himself ready to come back uh, December 10th 
And I don't know if that's going to be too quick of a turnaround, especially for a fight of this magnitude. This is not a mega fight by no means, but for these fighters, it is a mega fight. For Joseph Diaz, it is a mega fight because this will give him another opportunity to, you know, become a champion, something that has, you know, been slipping out of his his um his grip his grip so far in his career, albeit that he's only had one uh you know title opportunity. Still, you know, he want to be clicking on all the cylinders. He want to be um in the best condition, the best shape possible, full strength, full health, going into a matchup with a guy that is as slick and as elusive as Tevin Foreman is. And for Tevin Foreman. This fight will raise his profile if he can get the victory. Not saying that Joseph Diaz is a household name and one that is going to build his name to the masses of the casual fan. But in boxing circles, this is a very, very good win if he can get it. I think that it will catapult him to bigger fights. I think this is a fight that he needs in his, at this point in his career. It makes the most sense, like I said. All the other champions at 130 are tied up. So... What better way to finish off, you know, 2019 or kick off 2020 than with a big fight against a former Olympian, a former title, world title challenger, and a quality opponent in Jojo Diaz. So hopefully, man, the fight gets done. We can see these two guys um, lock horns, settle, settle their beef, um, and, you know, show who is the better fighter. Next up. Jamal Charlo will be making yet another meaningless defense of his WBC middleweight title, although it will be just his second defense. The first came this past June um, where he fought Brandon Adams. Or it could have been all because I forget. But anyway, look, he this is his second fight um, being the full WBC middleweight champion. As you all know, the WBC elevated their guy, their homie, Canelo Alvarez, as the franchise champion, which in turn made Jamal Charlo the full middleweight champion. So, you know, he'll be defending his title against Dennis Hogan December 7th at the Barclays Arena on Showtime. And look, this guy, Dennis Hogan, probably should be the WBO junior middleweight champion. He was robbed, in my opinion, against um, Jaime Mugea, but that fight took place in Mexico. So what do you expect to happen? You know what I'm saying? He wasn't going to get uh, the nod over there. He might get, um, you know, a card or so in his favor. But, you know, he they was going to give it to the hometown fighter. And that um, is exactly what happened. But, you know, for him to get this title opportunity, not being ranked, uh, shit, at, you know, middleweight whatsoever, I mean, it, it, it it's kind of like, blah, you know. Jamal Charlo, I don't know what his problem is. He says he's the best. Lines only him and his brother Jamel Charlo. Blase, blase, but yet they keep rolling out these guys that shouldn't be in the ring with him, especially if they haven't earned a mandatory spot or close to a mandatory spot and shown that they are capable of giving a good, valiant effort in making a competitive fight with Jamal Charlo, but his loyalty reigns supreme to Al Heyman, and obviously for me, for what I, for me, it tells me that, look, he's saying one thing about legacy being the best pound for pound fighter, best middleweight in the world, but his opponent, the selection, tells me otherwise. It tells me that, look, I'm getting paid two, three million to fight these guys, and I'm going to continue to do that. I'm going to continue to um, bank up, you know, the money that I'm getting, and then if... If an opportunity come my way, then I'll take it. But until then, I'm going to just do what I've been doing, and that's just coasting, coasting and talking occasional shit. But this is ridiculous, man. Dennis Hogan, Dennis Hogan has no chance whatsoever. You know, you think Tevin Foreman can't punch. Dennis Hogan definitely can't punch, and, and that was at 154. I don't know um, how his power will be. If it's going to be any power, um, once he moves up to 160, you know, in 31 bouts, he has seven knockouts. That is a whopping 22% knockout ratio. 
He's 5'8", 34 years old. He has no chance in hell to defeat Jamal Charlo unless Jamal Charlo just isn't himself. That's the only way. That's the only way. And I just don't see it. Jamal Charlo will go in this fight, make another successful defense of his title, and then just be, you know, who he is, you know. And he's going to be sporting a four-inch um, reach advantage in this fight. You know what I'm saying? He's six feet. Like I said, Hogan is 5'8". And this is just one of those fights, man, that is a stay-busy fight. I understand the Brandon, Brandon Adams fight. He just won contender. He's a solid fighter. You're trying to get a hometown fight, showcase fight in Houston, Texas, where he's born and raised. I get that. But now, man, look. You couldn't find nobody. I know Canelo fighting Kovalev. I know Andre is with his own. I know Jacobs is moving up to 168. I know Quillen just looked like shit. I know um, Billy Joe Saunders is over there at his own. I know all of this. But, bruh, for the sake of your career, for the sake of your career, please, please just fight somebody. This is ridiculous, man. It's to the point where it's like, it's like, why? You know what I'm saying? Why continue to, you know, go to count for these meaningless fights? If your career ended, man, you wouldn't be a 30th ballot Hall of Famer. In 29 fights, you have the best guys on your name, on your resume, are Austin Trout, Julian Williams, Cornelius Bungie and Matt Corball. And not to shit on them guys at all, because Julian Williams, you know, was knocked out by Jamal. But he bounced back, and now he's the unified junior middleweight champion. Austin Trout has defeated Miguel Cotto. He's been in the ring with Canelo Alvarez. I thought he won that fight. He's been in the ring with Ayers Lundy Laura. He's been in the ring with Jerry Hurd. He's been in the ring with your brother, Jamel Charlo. You know, I thought he beat Jamal. You know what I'm saying? Corball, you know, he's been in the ring with, you know, uh... Jose Gutage, Andy Lee, you know, he's a respectable fighter. We know about K-9. K-9 is a former champion. So, you know, I get, <laughs> you know, that he want to be loyal to Al Heyman. He don't want to have to sign no contract that binds him. But I'm pretty sure that a deal can be worked out that will make you comfortable enough to go on the other side of the street and face you know, somebody, man, somebody, Demetrius Andre, somebody, somebody, because this shit is not getting it, man. This is not getting it. I mean, this is just, it, 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 it's to the point now where it's just, it's ridiculous. It's embarrassing on your part. And, you know, everybody passing you by. Everybody passing you by, man, and that's just, that's just what it is. That's just what it is. Final topic. Dimitri Bivol, the forgotten guy at 175, will be facing Lennon Castillo on October 12th, uh, making another defense of his title. Uh, this guy, Castillo, if you're not familiar, type in YouTube right now, Lennon Castillo versus Marcus Brown, and you'll see that back in 2018, Castillo really won that fight. Obviously, he wasn't awarded the decision, but, you know, he won that fight against Marcus Brown, but ultimately was on the wrong side of a, a bad decision. But he gets another opportunity. And now this is an opportunity in a title fight against a guy that, in most opinion, is the best guy at 175, better than Sergey Kovalev, better than Olazandik Gavazic, better than Arthur Biradabiv. He is the guy. You know, he's undefeated. You know, he can box. He can punch. punch. Um, he's a consummate professional. But for whatever reason, he's the forgotten guy. You know, I had never seen him where the best guy is the forgotten guy. But in his situation, that is exactly what the case is. He is the forgotten guy. Um, but he will be here to remind us October 12th why he is the best guy at 175, in my opinion. You know, 16-0, 11 knockouts. Um, has some respectable names on his, on his resume. 
you know, Joe Smith Jr., who ended Bernard Hopkins' career, John Pascal, you know, Isaac Chalamba, Sullivan Barrera, you know, uh, he got some some good names on his um, resume. So, I mean, he's the goods. I look forward to seeing him fight. This is not the fight I would like to see him in, but this is the fight that he is indeed in. And, you know, he's going to make a showcase. He he He's going to stop uh, Lennon Castillo, man. Castillo's going to give it a good effort. He can punch. You know what I'm saying? He only got two losses in his career, 15 knockouts. Uh, in 23 career bouts, so he got a 65% knockout ratio. He's six foot two, you know, got a 76 inch reach. So you know, he got some things going in his way. He got a two inch height advantage over um, Bivol, who's six feet. Uh, but Bivol is the goods man, and he's gonna show it October 12th in Chicago on the zone. Why, you know, many people feel that he is the best light heavyweight in the world. That's going to do it for this video, man. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and like the video. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell button so you be notified every time I upload content. Drop those comments in the comment section down below. Let me know your thoughts on each and every one of these topics. Remember to check out 3kingsboxing.com daily for your latest and greatest updated unfiltered and unbiased boxing news and information reported the way it should be. Follow Three Kings Boxing on Twitter at Three Kings Boxing. Follow us on Instagram at Three Kings Boxing. Make sure you like the Facebook page, Three Kings Boxing. And again, check the website daily. Check the page daily for off the chain boxing content. Shout out to everybody that's rocking with us, man. Until next time, I am out. Peace.